Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast with Benji Nyson. This show is supported by our show partner, Lacol. This is our La Course preview. We're going to go through the course, talk about the tactics, <laughs> our list, favorites, who we think is going to win. We also have a, an interview within this podcast with the leader for drops, La Cole, supported by Tempur, Joss Loudon, British rider. She came fifth in Brabantia Pale, actually in a pretty strong group. So this sort of profile really suits her. Anyway, we've got a, a discussion with her uh, later on in the podcast. But the race is tomorrow on Saturday, Benji. It was supposed to be on Sunday on the Britannia stage. They've changed the route up a little bit. Why was that? Because I've actually forgotten. So um, indeed, it was supposed to be the second stage with the Tour de France that was made into the La Course parkour. So the Mur Britannia, like you mentioned, and the reason was some local elections or some local politics that actually ended up moving it to the day before. And indeed, that's why it's now uh, on Saturday with the London no finish with uh, the climb there as well. So a uh, bit of a parkour change. I don't think it changed too much when it comes to the feeling towards the race. I think that the Moon Britannia just had a bigger name for the race. And the climb in London no does not really have that. But all in all, I don't think... Uh, Riders had to change their schedule because let's say they change it to a flat stage or something that would have been that yeah. would have been horrible. <laughs> exactly, it's still a punchy finish, and this is the route: 107 and a half k's, four ascents of the Côte de la Loup, which the the male riders only finish on that climb. 3.1 k's, five and a half percent. I've been, I tell you what, I've been looking at this climb so much, I've gone crazy <laughs> thinking about stage <laughs> one in the in the men's race. It's Tough at the start and then levels off. So it looks like, you know, the first two Ks are relatively hard, but it's really the first, oh, first 1,200 meters, 1,400 meters of the steep part. There's a 10% 400 meter, se- well, actually, like a 10% 500 meter section, 600 meter section with a 14% pinch. And then it levels off, and the, the last 300 meters is about 1% average gradient. So where the finish is, is relatively flat. It's just the question of can you make it to that finish. And it's quite interesting, especially with the runners and teams we have here. For example, let's read, I'll read out a few of the leaders. So Cordon Rigo and Diagnan at Trek Segafredo. They've also got Ruth Winder, Taylor Wiles, and Ruth Lucinda Brand, very strong team, but no Elisa Longo Borghini. Uh, Mariana Voss leading Jumbo Visma. She won Amstel, obviously, from that reduced group after catching up after the Kalberg. Canyon Shram, leader will be Nivea Doma, who attacked on the Kauberg and was the strongest there. FDJ have got Cavalli, who's quick, Ludwig, who's a better climber. And then Bike Exchange again, Brown, who's quick and a good attacker, Sprout, the better climber. Lippert will probably lead DSM, but I'm not entirely sure. I'll talk about more, her, more on her later. The favorites will be SD Works, Fisher Black, probably working for Van der Breg and Van der Broek Black and Vollering. Incredibly strong team, Vollering winning Liège and Van der Breggen looking pretty good as well. They're the main headline riders. Um, is there anyone else you think could win this race, Benji? Hmm. I think that those are indeed the names that I'm looking for immediately. I think that Amadana Voss will have a harder time team-wise than certain other teams. So it really comes into play what team you have here as well, because let's say your SD works, you can just launch and fire attacks every single climb and whoever gets away, gets away. And you can't really do that if you are Jumbo Visma here. You've got one leader in Mariana Voss and then the team surrounding her being in support of that one leader. So it's dependent on your team, how good you can do here. And I think that that team play will come into this uh, race a lot. I do expect those uh, continuous attacks by SD Works. You do as well? Yeah, they well, I don't know. I was thinking about it because ideally you just want to carry volering over the climb but drop Voss and then sprint for the win with her did we miss did I have I made a big mistake I can't see the start I can't see Van Vleuten on the start list Benji correct I mean either so I mean the start list may not be final but stay tuned for that but the point is one would think SD works if it's a slower race we'll want to keep it together but and ride for Vollering at the end, but they've got so many options. Vandenbroek Black's a great one to throw up the road as well, and then Nee Fisher Black probably first. They'll throw her up the road, and then maybe they yeah they pace really hard with Van der Breggen and play with two two leaders at the end of the climb. I don't 
it's tough. Like Lippert won Cadell Evans Road Race. If it's wet conditions like then on a really – it's really steep pinch, then it flattens off. She won that, but she hasn't shown that form for 18 months. But this is a similar profile. It's tough to know what form they're in as well because a lot of them haven't raced recently. Yep. Mariana Voss, how long was that Liège climb? She got dropped on Benji. It was like double the length of this, right? Yeah, it was a it was a pretty long one. It was also not on the uh, initial climb that she got dropped. I think that you've got that initial climb, and then there was like a bit of a flat section yeah, on top, and then it went up again. Yes, indeed, it was on that top section that she got that she got dropped. Uh, I do have some extra background on why Annemiek van Vleuten is skipping oh, yeah. this race because. Uh, she actually uh, spoke out against the uh, route change from Moudbritani to the one of, well, Londerno. And she stated in a press release that she would skip the race due to the route and they changed so she could focus completely on the Olympic Games. So uh, it's a, ba- a bigger aim for her, the Olympics. And I think that's the uh, main reason, to be honest. Fair enough. I mean, she's already won the course before, so... Probably Olympics is something she wants to add to her Palmares. 2020 edition was won by Lizzie Diagman. Trek had perfect tactics there. They really forced Voss to close. And that was a flat finish, though, after a longer climb. 2019 was Voss again on a slightly uphill finish. She literally gapped everybody. And 2018 was Van Vleuten. Uh, And then 2017, Van Vleuten again. So, yeah, she's won the race a few times. I understand her focusing on the Olympics. I've kind of changed my mind again, Benji, honestly. You've kind of convinced me. You're talking about Liège and how long this steep section is. I think you're right that SD Works need to do something to put Voss under pressure before this final climb. I think if they just try and pace, they might get unlucky with their ability to drop her. So I think they're going to have to attack. What about Trek as well? Surely Trek will, with the riders they have, try and attack early. They can't just... Put it all on Diagon to win a sprint. I recall one of the Ardennes where uh, Cordelona Go started attacking early as well. I think that Taylor Wiles was usually the person that they kept in the group behind to try and uh, lure back people that were trying to get away. For example, if another team decides to put a, a rider up ahead to try and put some pressure on them, Wiles was usually the one that was trying to close it from the elite group. And Lucinda Brand is someone I'd expect to go uh, pretty early as well. And that's all like basically potential earlier attackers. And I think Dagnan is just their uh, their main goal here. If the others don't succeed in setting anything up or using the others to try and put pressure on the other teams, that would work out. And let's say that one of their riders, a Trek rider, gets in that break together with an SD Works rider. And we've also got a Canyon rider in there. Those are the three bigger teams team-wise, I think. And... Then I'm curious who's going to be able to try and close it because then you'll need to have Liv, potentially Movistar, if they still have Allroot for this as well. And FDG, for example, if they still have somebody there, if it's a musician or someone, those teams would have to work together. Grace Brown would have to put someone at the front of the group to also try and help. And if you're going to spend your energy on catching riders from both SD Works and Trek, then they're going to have someone else to attack with just after that. When, for example, if Nee Fisher Black gets caught, then they go with the next one. <laughs> it's as simple as that as they work. So yeah. just a continuous amount of attacks. And I think they can keep on doing that until either one sticks or they go towards the last climb with both on the Debregen and Vollering. And then it's uh, going to be curious what's going to happen from that point onwards. Let's take a pause now and we'll go to our interview with Joss Loudon of Drops the Coal and then we'll be back afterwards for Benji and my final picks and dark horses for this race La Course 2021. Welcome Joss Loudon to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. Thanks for joining me. We're three or four days out from La Course, the Women's World Tour race that occurs on pretty much the same finishing circuit as Tour de France Stage 1. Joss, are you how do you think this race will play out? We were just discussing offline. It looks like an Ardennes-style circuit. Do you think it's going to be another similar battle like in Liège where SD Works is trying to put pressure on the quicker Mariana Voss to avoid Amstel type scenario? Yeah. Do you think a break has any chance? I think it's, yeah, to, to liken it to Ardennes is going to, I think is probably yeah pretty good call. Um, I think SD Works are going to have a really strong team and they will... Um, be able to I think probably make the race how they they want it to be they've got um, lots of 
lots of different ways I think they can win the race. Um, yeah, my money is on following for it. I think that the climb and the race, I think it will just suit her really well. Um, I think, yeah, they're going to make that climb real hard. Um, and obviously we've got to do it four times before any sort of sprint at the finish. So um, it will be the pieces that get sort of pulled together at the end that's going to be able to make a sprint for it. But yeah, my money's on following. I think volume is a good call because it's steep at the start, then flattens out at the end. So if it if they drop Voss or keep at least keep her behind, then if say, you know, Van Vleuten will still be there, Van der yeah. can lead out volering again and, and she's is, way way quicker than everyone else. It is um, you know, a longish climb. We've got um is it something like um is it is it three kilometers, three point seven kilometers or something like that? So it's yeah, yeah. it's pretty pretty long overall to um <laughs> to battle it out or to keep it going after the steep bit at the bottom. So, um, and climbing against Vollering at uh, Brabant, I mean, she just made it look all so comfortable, so easy. <laughs> um, I think that they could ride Voss off the wheels there. You came fifth at Brabant Chapelle, same group as Ruth Winder and Vollering, yeah. similar uphill finish, not not crazy steep like flesh. Will that be your plan again? Just try and get it be in good position at the base that final climb, and, and then see how how well you can go. Go for a top ten or a top five. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I think that probably yeah, similar to Brabant, it's going to be a case of just um, follow. Um, yeah, try and stay in that fun group. I think that it's yeah, it's going to be interesting what happens on the circuit after the climb and how much it comes back together and um, maybe sort of by. The, the sort of the penultimate time we go up it it might then split I reckon and there might be a smaller group away and I guess yeah that's exactly it to just try and be be in there but um I've had a bit of time off uh, I picked up a knee injury at flesh actually um which is oh, a lot really? better now but uh some time off has made my legs uh they're a bit <laughs> they're not quite as good as they were but hopefully it will be uh good enough to to do something. <laughs> Don't tell Eddie Merckx or Patrick Lefebvre you got a knee injury. I mean, Lefebvre, I'm not sure if you saw the Sam Bennett stuff this week. He's saying, I don't believe Bennett's got a knee injury. So, oh, really? No, <laughs> he didn't tell tell believe that. it. Oh, yeah. never mind. <laughs> Battle wounds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the Cavendish stuff was so, it was, it was so weird. But, yeah, who do you – when you've, been, you've done the whole Arden circuit this year, maybe what's something that stood out to you that – surprised you or uh, maybe people won't see from the outside re you know relative team strengths like we everyone says SD works is so strong but is there another team for example that maybe before the live coverage starts that really dominates the race like a trek or someone like that um yeah interesting to be honest so the things that stood out I guess yeah the, the teams that have multiple riders that are able to climb like they do um that's something that you can you can really appreciate uh when you were sort of racing get some canyon um have quite a lot of bells up there and they ride in a way that definitely like supports each other it's um yeah you can you can tell that that it's almost like the safety in numbers <laughs> thing so um yeah canyon definitely noticed it um s d works is obviously super strong um to, to be honest, in in uh, at uh, Liège, it was also um, Yumbo with uh, the likes of Anna Henderson up there as well. Um, they, you know, they okay. were strong. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, it's not just SD Works that um, <laughs> is the, the only strong team, but they certainly stand out. With, I think because they've just got so many riders that can climb like that, and they can be out there at the fin- at the finish. Yeah, and they sort of they complement each other really well with Vanderbreg and more TT and Volering more punch and sprint. Yeah, so exactly. Th- this is the last. I don't know if this is the last year of La Course, uh, whether because the Tour de France Women's Tour de France starts next year, organised by ASO. I presume that means La Course ceases to exist as a one day race. Eight stages of the, of the women's tour. We don't really know the parkour. What when you hear, heard that announcement? What was your initial reaction? Um, yeah, I mean, you you just go, oh, that's really cool. Like it's it's really great. It's it's going to be on. Um, it's one of those things that you kind of think it's always going to be next year. It's always going to be or always next year. They're going to announce that it's next year and always next year. And you think, oh, actually, it's in touching distance yeah. now and. Yeah, it just made me think, yeah, like I really want to race it. I think any considerations that I had that this might be my last season got firmly 
put uh, put aside as soon as I heard that we oh, would really? have an opportunity to, to <laughs> race like a Tour de France. And yeah, I just hope that they they make it like as good and as big a race as I feel like it deserves and that it, it can can be and it should be. It's got potential to be you know massive and have really really good course and good days and good mountain stages and uh, yeah, I hope that that's what it turns out to be. Yeah, I mean I. There's always debate about okay, should it be on the same day as the men's, and then you have like the because that's what the, the all the Belgian classics do, mm. and then you keep that interest, you carry that TV interest over. You've already got the hooked audience, but then from my selfish perspective, I prefer them on separate days. I prefer I was happy the Paris Bay is on a separate day because journalists, TV broadcasters, maybe even the audience, I think has a certain amount of bandwidth on that day to cover it properly, and I worry. If you put them on the same day, you know, you then people aren't able to cover them as well sep- uh, as they would if they were separate. So I'm kind of happy they're on separate days, and I'm yeah. just interested to see what the parkour looks like. Yeah, I agree. To be honest, I think that it's um, you know it, it gets an, it gets quite a lot of interest. It will get a lot of interest in its own right without having to piggyback on the back of the men's. And like you say, like you sit down for an afternoon to watch some cycling, it doesn't necessarily mean you want to watch a whole day, like. <laughs> All the women's race, all the men's race, yeah. maybe separate. But, uh, but I think it should be set to be cool. Before then, you got. I, just, I saw you've uh, announced your hour record attempt coming up, and you did sort of an unofficial hour record previously. So that's depending on weather conditions, because I'm not an expert on that sort of stuff. That you know, all the temperature and pressure, etc. Is that end of September, start of October? And, and are, you, are you doing it at altitude or uh, sort of sea level? I'm going to do it in Brenchen in Switzerland. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, okay. I think it's about 450 meters. But so it's basically like a sea level attempt. Um, okay. But okay. the track is, a, yeah, pretty quick track. Apparently, I've never actually ridden on it. But um, yeah, that's, yeah, just fit that in um, sort of off the back of Worlds and before the women's tour. It's going to be a really busy period, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully, it'll go well. <laughs> so are you, what are you doing that's sort of, special for that are you doing changing your training up are you having to go to manchester or derby to do very like more testing what was the sort of preparation you'll be doing for that um at the moment no no a lot <laughs> um i will <laughs> have, haven't been on a track since i did my sort of practice practice run which was back in february um so yeah, I mean, getting track time is going to be really difficult because we've got a busy calendar. So I will be doing some yeah. sort of altitude training and a lot of training on my TT bike, which helps. But um, yeah, trying to get the track time is yeah pretty crucial. Um, I'm not, I haven't, you know, spent years and years and years riding around a track. I'm not naturally, um, you know, naturally like, you know, got a lot of technique on the track. But somehow it kind of just kind of seems to come together when you're in that sort of situation. Like you've got, when you know, when you've done the calculations of how much further you have to ride if you don't ride on the black, and then you know it, then you're like, I'm riding that black line. <laughs> I'm not going to drift. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, just kind of prepare for it as best as they can, given everything else that's going on, I guess. And maybe for people that don't realise, like I, I spoke to Matthias Norsgaard, the Danish young TT guy, a couple of years ago when he was doing at Yorkshire for Worlds. And he's like, what people don't understand is how expensive it is to do something like an hour record attempt. Yeah. Like you don't just turn up to a track and do it like you – it takes planning, sponsors. Like, do you have to then, I presume, to get it validated, do you need to like organise it with the UCI to, so they have people there? Oh, yeah. It's, it's actually hugely complicated to make it an official UCI world record, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm – really fortunate that I have Nicole that are completely backing and supporting the attempt. Um, if like, I mean, like, yeah, with everything in terms of the logistics, uh, the, yeah, the putting it on as well as the, the cost for it, because it's, um, yeah, I mean, everything from, so you've got to be on the like human biological passports. That's like the anti-doping uh, yeah. testing pool. And then everything like from the timing has to be the official UCI TSO branded timing and you've got to have commissaires there and it's yeah it's a logistical operation to put it on uh, in itself let alone actually doing it sometimes you kind of think that actually doing the hour the effort itself will be the easy bit in comparison to the organizing of it we'll see maybe ask me after that 
Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll be watching. Will that be? Will it be live stream? Do you know? I think they're looking at trying to get a live stream for it. I've I've said to Lacole, you, you you can if you want. Okay. I don't want to know about it. Like I'm much more of a uh, I'm better to do something and then talk about it afterwards than oh, to right. kind of shout about it before I do it. <laughs> but <laughs> I uh, I'll leave it in their hands okay. and they can decide what they want to do with it. All right. Well, thanks very much for joining Arsenal Lantern Roof Cycling Podcast, Joss. We'll be watching. Uh, of course, with interest to see how you go. Drops the Cole have kind of been our home team on the podcast for uh, the season so far, so hoping you get a good result there. Cool. Thanks for having me. Big thanks again to Joss Loudon for joining the show to give her insight into the course and maybe the uh, and the TDF 2022 for women next year. Time to put you on the spot, Benji. I've already flip-flopped. I got my dark horse, Ruth Winder, for the win. I think... Trek should ride for her, not Diagnan. Looking at the way she beat Volering in a flat finish at Brabant's Pale. She did well in that Navarra Classic, which had like 13% pinches sort of climbs for 300, 400 metres. I think she'll be fine. I think they should ride for Winder, but I'm going with uh, I'm going with Voss for the, for the win, uh, for, as hmm, most likely. Okay. Yeah. I think that um, my go-to pick is also Voss here, but... I think I'm going to actually switch around. I I'm going to go for Cecilia Tripoludwig after that Burgos stage Yeah, race similar finish, had. isn't it? Similar finish as the one she won. Then again, I feel like um, this is going to be written differently than a stage in a stage race. And as a consequence, I'm not sure that that stage is someone to something to look at for this one, but I believe she had good form there. I believe it hasn't been that long since then. A lot of other riders will have had a big pause from their previous season goals. And with proper training blocks in there, it's curious how their legs are going to respond to the to the race tempo again. And um, yeah, it's either Ludwig or potentially an early attack by Brown, but I'm going to say Ludwig here. Yeah. I reckon it'll be something like Van der Broek Black riding away and the other team's not being strong enough to chase. She attacks <laughs> like 30Ks to go thus. That's certainly possible yeah. as well. But, yeah, we're looking forward to La Course. It's on bright and early, I think, tomorrow on Saturday morning. So make sure you get up and watch that a short, sharp race before the then, you know, if you want to see which women will be competing at the Olympics, a lot of them will be in that race. And then we've got the Tour de France 2022 next year, an eight-stage race for women. It starts the day, I think, the last day of the Tour de France for men or the day after and then runs for another eight days we're looking forward to that a lot next year we can't wait for the route announcement for that which will be at the same time as the men's race route announcement later in october this year maybe benji and i can snag a couple of invites to that event but anyway we hope you enjoyed this preview of the course tomorrow and we'll have the recap of it tomorrow afterwards ciao